All righty. You have no undivided attention. What can I do for you? Other than this cup, I'm also attention. Now you said, uh, I'm sorry, I had trouble hearing you. The IR spectroscopy, what about, what do you want to know about it? Say you're trying to figure out what the, what the name of it is. Yeah, what the name of it is. The name of a molecule? Mm -hmm. Okay, so how to use IR spectroscopy? Okay, so uh, in IR, IR is all about identifying functional groups. So what would be fair game on the exam would be a couple of things. Number one, I could give you a molecule and ask you where might you look in, in an IR spectrum to determine whether or not it was that molecule or not. Or I can give you a spectrum and say which of the following molecules is best represented by that spectrum, right? So what you want to do, of course, this is wave number, right? This is percent transmittance. And so we want to start at 1500. And everything to the right of 1500, we call this the fingerprint region. And for the purposes of this class, we're going to ignore that, right? We're only going to use this to identify functional groups. We're then going to come over at 2000. And we're going to draw another line. And everything between 1500 and 2000 is the SP2 region. Then from 2000 to 2500, the SP region, and then everything else is the hydrogen region. Okay, so if you see a signal or an absorption or a percent transmittance signal, whatever you want to call it, in here, this means you're going to have something like carbon-carbon double bonds, carbon-oxygen double bonds, carbon-nitrogen double bonds, etc. So what might you find in there, right? You can find benzene rings because they have double bonds. You might find anything that contains a carbonyl, a C double bond O, right? So ketones, aldehydes, uh, and you might find uh, imines. Okay, so any of those types of things you will find in that region. The SP region, you'll find things like carbon-carbon triple bonds or carbon-nitrogen triple bonds. Uh, you can even find carbon dioxide here because the carbon is SP hybridized. Anything, anything there. So you'll find things like alkynes, terminal alkynes where one of, you know, there's a hydrogen. You can find nitriles. Okay. And then in the hydrogen region, this is where you're going to find the different types of hydrogen. So if you find something around 3300 and it looks like a nice parabola, that's usually indication for an alcohol, right? If you find uh, a really broad peak that goes pretty much over the whole, that's usually an indication of a carboxylic acid. So that OH typically looks like this, but you will also see a carbonyl for that, okay? And then also we've got other types of hydrogen. So you'll have SP3. Hydrogens attached to SP3 uh, carbons, SP2 carbons, and SP. And so you'd be able to look at those. So in your book, there is a correlation table. You know, if you, if you think you need to know kind of what's going on in the hydrogen region, you might want to write some of that down in your notes. Um, so that's that's kind of what you would you would expect, and so uh, you know it, it would be fair game for me to give you a molecule or a pair of molecules, something like that, and ask you how would how would you distinguish between those in an IR spectrum. Right, you had a homework question along those lines. I gave you solutions to that. 
So, you know, I would be looking in the hydrogen region and in the carbonyl region to distinguish these two molecules, right? Of course, they both are going to have hydrogens. This one would only show up in the hydrogen region. This one would show up in the hydrogen region and have a strong absorption for a ketone. So, that's kind of what. Yeah? Is that say SP3 hydrogen? Mm -hmm. So, like a hydrogen attached, you know, to SP3 hybridized carbons. And then a little further to the left will be hydrogens that are attached to SP2 hybridized carbons. And a little further to the left will be hydrogens that are attached to alkynes. Right, so they kind of move as you go, move to the left a little bit as you, as you go from there. So the one that in the hydrogen region, the one, not the alcohol, is the other one the carboxyl? Here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's a carbonyl. Okay. So you'll find, you'll find that here, and you find that here. Is this table like basically what you're talking about? Where it's like specific? Like yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other questions about that? For the, uh, the 1500 to 2000 range. Okay, so say you're looking um, for between two molecules that have a C double bond O another has a C double bond in. Wouldn't the O come down further than the nitrogen? So yeah, it's based it, off of electronegativity. It, 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 yeah, so as you change the dipole when you stretch it, it's what gives rise to the strength of the absorption. The one that's almost down towards the bottom. Is yeah, the so. Oxygen. Yeah, and that's, that's probably a bit. Um, I probably wouldn't go into that kind of detail with you, but knowing that a real strong absorption is a C double bond O is certainly fair game, whereas a weaker absorption is usually a C double bond C. But the C double bond N versus C double bond O, I don't think I put anything on there that you would have to distinguish that. I mean, you would really need a good correlation table for that. We didn't go into that level of detail, so we're gonna we're gonna keep it pretty pretty straightforward. And this isn't the one, the fifteen hundred to two thousand region, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Thomas is a very good spectroscopist, so he did not. No, he really is a very good spectroscopist. I asked him if, um, if it was him that you're always referring to as your grad student that likes it a lot, and he was like, well, Dr. Masterson thinks I'm great at it, but I think I'm just okay. He's just being humble. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, he, he is really good at spectroscopy. Yeah, he explained it very well. He likes to put those puzzles together. Any other questions about that? Anybody want to take a picture? Watch it on the video later. Either way. What else? on this exam, I'm thinking back to what I've done, I focused pretty much on the proton anymore, the hydrogen anymore. So let's just talk about that one for now, right? So um, you know, always start around five, right? The little thing that we see at zero is our reference that is used to set zero for us, so we ignore that, right? The first thing that you need to do anytime you're looking at an NMR is count the number of signals, right? If you, if you know that you have three signals, you can usually eliminate questions based on that, right? So if you had three signals, something there, something there, I mean, I'm just, I don't really know what I'm drawing right now, but let's say you had that, right? So you had three signals. 
and you went through and you looked at the molecules and you went, only two of them would give rise to three signals, eliminate the others, right? And then just focus on those. And then you'd start looking at the splitting patterns. Remember the N plus one rule, right? So, you know, if something's a quartet, that means it has how many neighbors? Three. Yeah, so this has three neighbors. This one I drew as a quartet too, so it also has three neighbors. But a singlet would have no neighbors, right? So uh, you're going to do that. So just to let you know, there are questions on the exam where I will give you an NMR spectrum, and you have to determine which of the four or five molecules is the right one. So the first thing that I would do is count the signals, eliminate based on the number of signals. Uh, and then I would look at the splitting patterns and where it's located on the spectrum. Right, if it's over here, we're talking about sp3 and sp, and over here we're talking about sp2, so hydrogen's attached to those types of carbons. Right, and remember upfield and downfield. If something's a little further downfield, it may have something electronegative next to it. Right. So keep that in mind. Um, you need to know what integration is, but you will not need to use integration to answer any of the questions that I do. Are we going to calculate IHD? No. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't put that on there. Index of hydrogen division. What do you mean by SP2? Like right there, you mean like SP2 hybridized hydrogens? No, no, there's no, there's no such thing as an SP2 hybridized hydrogen, right? It's just because hydrogens can only have one bond. I mean, attached to an SP2 something. That's right. So, for example, you might find benzene out here, right? Because the carbons are SP2? Yeah, and so that's going to be, you know, benzene somewhere around 7 to 8. But, you know, closer to 5, you'll find things like alkenes. Just a little bit on either side of 5, you'll find alkenes. Right, so you can find those types of things on this side of, of, of 5. Way out here, we're talking about things like carboxylic acids. You'd find those out here around 10 or 12. You'll also find aldehydes way out here towards 10 to 12. Go over what integration is. Yeah, so let's say we had, uh, let me see if I can draw something a little more real. So let's say we had, uh, let's see, that would be a triplet. Somewhere out here we'd have a quartet. And like right in here we'd have a singlet. So this would have an integration of, let's say, 3 to 2 to uh, 3. Okay? So really what this tells you is the relative number of hydrogens that are responsible for each of those signals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so it might be the absolute number of hydrogens, but you don't know. But it is the correct relative number. Right? So that would be like 1 to 1.5 to 1.5, okay, if you're actually measuring it with a ruler. This happens to be roughly the NMR spectrum for... that molecule right there. All right, so there's three hydrogens here with two neighbors. It would be a triplet. It's going to be upfield. This carbon has two hydrogens on it, and they're going to be a quartet because they're three neighboring hydrogens. And it's going to be the furthest downfield because this carbon's attached to an oxygen. And then this is this CH3. Right? And it's a singlet because there are no neighboring hydrogens. Okay. So integration is just those numbers telling you the relative. The relative number of hydrogens. That's right. When the NMR machine spits out the data, it spits out a number. 
and then we have to actually normalize it to the actual number so if those, we know it. So there's one there like where it goes like you just mentioned like you know two is one, three is one point five. Drawing down. Some of them have one point five. Yeah, so I mean the relevant number is Y'all good? You good? Yeah, we're good. Thanks. Okay. Just take that. Appreciate it. And you have half a proton? No, you just multiply it. Right? Yeah, so you multiply through, right? That's how you get the two to three. Okay, so because that's what I thought you did. But sometimes it pops up there and I'm like, hmm. So know the n plus one rule, know the you know, know your know your splittings. It would be helpful. I gave you all kind of a rough table of where things typically appear. That's in one of our presentations. You might want to have that. In. I will tell you that there is one problem where I give you a couple of reactions and there's a final product, and then I give you a choice of what those products are, and I give you the NMR. Okay, so if you forget what one of those reactions does, you could actually not even look at that and go, let me look at the NMR and see which of these molecules best matches that NMR. Okay. Could you make like that side list that you usually do where it's like, oh, the test will be roughly these subjects? Pardon? Just, Can you, know, I? you know, in like the past revision session, you wrote like a little list on the side well, where like yeah, you want to know. just roughly the. Yeah, so uh, roughly what we're talking about is everything up through chapter 12. Right, so we didn't get into uh, chapter 13. So we are talking about things like alcohols and are still fair game. We started talking about benzene and its derivatives. Right, so we did benzene, we did aromatic systems. I will tell you there's a lot on aromatic on the exam. It's something that's very important for you all to know. Right, so know what goes into an aromatic thing. What does it mean to be aromatic? What things do you need to remember? Cyclic, planar, conjugated. Cyclic, planar, conjugated, yes. What else? Buckles rule. Buckles rule, which is? Pi electron, that's right. Can we do an example of like how we, what a question would be like? Uh, I can tell you there is a question where I give you some molecules and ask you which of the following is aromatic. Can you do an example of that? Uh, I'm afraid I'll give away the problem. Uh, <laughs> but what you will do is you will assume that every molecule that I've given you is planar to do that and really what I'm asking you to do is to apply all of those rules uh, to determine which of which of the four or five that are there are aromatic. And I'm not throwing you a curveball with it. Okay, it's, it's a pretty straightforward question. Are there, so you mentioned alcohol, so there's still going to be chapter eight on this test? Or is that just a little bit. Okay. Alcohols are still there. Are there, well, like, like non-oxides or uh, there is a question on epoxides, yes. So about that chapter two, so I was going through it earlier, like taking some extra notes, and a whole section of it was dedicated to like dials or something, like without the only Dials? Yeah. I don't put anything about dials. I didn't see any in the notes. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't put anything about dials on that. Um, but, you know, when we covered the amine chapter, they were talking about epoxides mm -hmm. reacting with amines, so that's, that's why it's, it's building. So yeah. it's, it's still fair to you. Uh-huh. Do you have an example using bubbles for Sure. So let's, uh, let's take a molecule other than benzene. Let's 
a good old fashioned map fling, which is mothballs. What's that? You've never seen a mothball before? My grandparents were dead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so grandparents used to, in their winter jackets and stuff, would put mothballs before they hung it up for the summer. Uh, that's the uh, odor that you would typically smell in quote unquote old people. It's just, it's not really old. Is, is All right, so a, is it cyclic? Is that a, is there another double bond right there? Or like that middle bond, is that a double or? So there isn't a double, so it's like one benzene ring and then one not, not a benzene ring? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So we gotta ask ourselves, is this, is this, is this aromatic? Well, let's assume it's planar, it is. Would you say it's cyclic? Yes. Yeah. yeah, if I start here and I go all the way around, right? I can get back to where I started without ever lifting my, my pencil, so it's cyclic. Is it conjugated? Yep. Every, you, know, you got double bond, single bond, 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 double bond. So it, it is conjugated all the way around. But what about that middle bond? Isn't that technically not? Well, remember, when we're talking about something being aromatic, we're only talking about the pi electrons, right? So this is a sigma bond, and that's double, single, double. So that's still conjugated. Oh, is there not a bond in the middle? There is. There is a bond between these two carbons, but it's still double bond between here, then single bond between these, and then double bond. Okay. So it's conjugated all the way around. So we've decided that these three are all correct. Now we've got to do Huckel's rules. So 4n plus 2 is equal to the number of pi electrons. So I have to count the pi electrons, right? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So 4n equal 8, n equal 2. Does that satisfy Huckel's rule? Yes. What does it mean to satisfy Huckel's rule? n must be a whole number including 0. It can't be a fraction. So if you stick that into your calculator and it came out 2.2, it would not be satisfying Huckel's rule. It has to come out to exactly an integer value. Is that when you do the 4n, just the 4n uh, formula for the anti-pi or the anti-aromatic? 4n is for anti-aromatic, yeah. I right. don't think I have any questions for anti-aromatic on that. Would you just automatically build that if that comes out to the think. Well, not necessarily. A molecule can be non-aromatic as well and still satisfy 4N. It may not be planar. It may not be fully conjugated. It may not be... Uh, so the answer for um, Huckel's rule, it just has to come up to like a whole number. But isn't it, doesn't it, have, doesn't it have to be like 2, 6, 10, 14? You can, you can do all of those if you want to memorize them. Yes, you can do it that way. Right? Because I told you n can be any, it could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right? So you could, if n was 0, right? 4 times 0 plus 2 is equal to what? 2. So 2 electrons could satisfy Huckel's rule. What would that look like? Well, that satisfies Huckel's rule. Every carbon is conjugated. There's a carbocation, which means there's a p orbital. It's two electrons. That's called the cyclopropenal cation, and it is it is aromatic. It is stable. That is not on the exam. I'll tell you that. That's the that one. So yeah, you could put in, you know, then you could do n equal one, right? And then that would be six, right? You could, you could do the number of electrons if you wanted to tell it. I would just recommend you know how to count the number of pi electrons and then solve for Huckel's rule. It's a lot easier. Yeah. All right. So where were we? Uh, aromatic. 
So, knowing how things are aromatic, know what kinds of reactions aromatic compounds can do, know your electrophilic aromatic substitution, right? So, electrophilic aromatic substitution, we talked about bromination, chlorination, nitration, sulfonation, we talked about Friedel Crafts alkylation, Friedel Crafts acylation. So, know all of those reagents. I think that's all we talked about. Yeah, so bromine and iron tribromide, right, would give you bromination of an aromatic ring. Chlorine and iron trichloride will give you chlorination of an aromatic ring. HNO3 and H2SO4 will do a nitration of an aromatic ring, put an NO2 group on it. Yeah? Is the, the uh, bromine and is that just halogenation? Yes. Just halogenation. So, you know, for example, if we were doing benzene, right, that would make bromobenzene. That would make chlorobenzene. That would make nitrobenzene. Uh, SO3 and H2SO4 would make sulfonic acid. Uh, RCL and aluminum trichloride will do Friedel Crafts alkylation. Remember, Friedel Crafts alkylation is tricky because of rearrangement. So if you have so imagine pulling off the halogen. If that was a carbocation, could it rearrange to a more stable carbocation? If it does, rearrange it. Sure. So let's say I wanted to react benzene with chloromethane and aluminum trichloride, what I would get out of that is simply toluene or methylbenzene. There's no possibility for rearrangement there, right? But if I was to react benzene with something like, oh, let's do uh, let's do that. Right, you might expect to get you might expect to get that, but in fact, that won't happen. Right? Because again, if you think about the aluminum trichloride pulling off the chlorine, that would give me a secondary carbocation. Right? I can get a rearrangement. to that carbocation. And so my product would actually look like it would be attached right there. It's that carbon. It's that carbon. So it can undergo rearrangements with the Friedel Crafts alkylation. Now acylation, right, you need an acid chloride and aluminum trichloride and that will give you ketones as your product with no rearrangements. Okay, it's going, the aromatic ring is going to attach to the carbon of the carbonyl in Friedel Crafts acylations. So you said there's not you're not going to do the um, IHD. What about the um what determine the number of signals you would expect to see? Yep, that's a fair game question. I might ask you, 
I could, I could give you a molecule and say, how many proton NMR signals would you expect to see? One, two, three, four, five, six, half, whatever, right? I could do that. Right, so if we were looking at a molecule How many, let me draw on the hydrogens. How many signals would you expect to see? You gotta be more definitive than that. It is just three, right? There's a plane of symmetry. So that's a signal. These two are mirror related, so that's a signal. And these two are mirror related, that's a signal. So there are three signals that you would expect to see for what we would call para nitro toggle. So, take home messages, know your electrophilic aromatic substitution stuff. Uh, we also talked about, or learned about, ketones and aldehydes and what we can do with those, right? So we can reduce them to alcohols. We learned two reagents to do that. What were the reagents? Uh, LAH. Um. Okay, so LAH or... So for bromine, so it's, uh, I can't remember. It's not SO4. Uh -huh. NABH4. NABH4, yes. Sodium borohydride. So usually what you'll see is like sodium borohydride being used with something like methanol, or it can be in water, it can be in ethanol, it can be in any alcohol. Those two things will go together usually to do the reduction. Lithium aluminum hydride, usually you'll see that as a two-step process, LAH followed by water with a little bit of acid. It's two separate steps because LAH is so reactive, you don't want it uh, to be around when, when water is present. So you want to add the water after all the LAH has been reacted. But that will reduce the ketone to a alcohol. We can also reduce aldehydes. following the same procedure to alcohols, <coughs> right, we can do that. So if I reduce an aldehyde, I get a primary alcohol. If I reduce a ketone, I get a? Tertiary. So if I reduce a ketone. Reduce it, oh, you get a primary, an alcohol. Uh -huh. What do I have up here? Is that primary or secondary? Secondary. All right, remember I'm making a carbon hydrogen bond, not a carbon carbon bond. Now if I take a ketone and I react it with a Grignard, I end up making a tertiary alcohol. If I take an aldehyde and react it with a Grignard, I end up making a secondary alcohol. So we also talked about Grignard reagents, right? So know how to make Grignard reagents. How do we make Grignard reagents? Grignard, uh, magnesium and ether. Magnesium or Magnesium and ether, that's the reagent, but what do I need to start with? That's a question. Alright, so if I want to make this Grignard, CH3 MGBR. I would react something with magnesium and ether. You're right there. Oh, an acid? H plus? No, no acid. It's like the benzene with like the bromine or the chlorine on it. Okay, but do I have a benzene here? No. No, but you're right. So what do I need? It's got the bromine here, right? Mm -hmm. So I need this. 
Remember, the magnesium inserts itself between the bromine and the carbon. Oh, yeah. So that's how we, we make grid drugs. So that could be a fair question. We also learned that we can react carbonyls, either ketones or aldehydes, with primary amines. And we get this thing called an imine. We also learned that we could take a ketone or an aldehyde and we can react it with things like ethylene glycol and paratoluene sulfonic acid, which is just organic version of sulfuric acid. And we can convert it from a ketone to a, what do we call this one? Uh, yeah, it's an acetal. Yeah. In this case, it is cyclic because the two alcohols are connected together, right? It is an acetal. Yeah. Chapter 10, we talked about amines a little bit. Amines can be good nucleophiles. They will react with alkyl halides. They will react with epoxides. But they can also function as what? As bases, right? So 